Okay, we're gonna wait a few minutes as everyone starts coming in. Sure. Yeah, it's very organized, well organized. You send out like the big email to, with the link and it's quite a complex thing to organize, isn't it? it? It was a lot more than I imagined, you know, but thankfully the platform has made it, I mean, I put it all towards Zoom. So it's kind of helped just keeping it all there. Um, yeah. I feel a lot of the conversations we'll be having will be on in this format. So I have better master it sooner or later. I, 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 I'm telling you the future of broadcasting is, you know, internet casting and these apps that can kind of do the switching using AI, uh, you know, detecting Absolutely. voice and everything. It's really cool. It looks like a TV show almost, and totally. it's only going to get more slick and, and the potential, I mean, we had the, you know, the video of, um, our correspondent getting handcuffed, you know, in the middle of his live shot. I think it had like 30 million views on Twitter. Uh, Omar Jimenez's clip. I mean, it's just, you could never have that many views on television. So you, you know, I know. the internet is really where it's at. Right. Right. I think that's going to be the future, at least for the next six months year. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until something else is invented and it changes. again. <laughs> totally. Okay, we're gonna now it's like mobile. Bit. Desktop is passe now. It's all about mobile. Um, totally. If you think about it, it's true because how often are you looking, unless you're at work, at, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking on your phone. So that's how right. we're consuming everything. I know. Okay, so everyone's kind of coming in. I'm going to wait a few more minutes to let everyone come in. Peter from Hungary. Hello, Peter. <laughs> nice to see so you. So what is, what is the format? How is this going to work, Elle? We're going to discuss that in a few seconds. I'll go okay. over that with everyone so everyone's aware. Everyone's on the same Better. page. Good but it's going to be a conversation between us. And then okay. as questions come in, we will either give the opportunity for the guests to ask the questions or I'll ask it for them. Great. So, okay. In about another minute, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Thank you all for joining. Let me see you all. Okay. Okay, Dan, thumbs up. Good. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. And before I introduce our guest, I'm gonna go over some housekeeping items with everyone. Um, the International Community of the Society of Professional Journalists, it's a community of journalists. We encourage press freedom globally. Our aim in our IC Talk series is to connect journalists at a time when it's difficult to do that in person. So we wanna do those one-on-one -on -one conversations, dig a little deeper and provide an avenue for our community to directly access and connect with our speakers. Um, we hope you learn and grow and take information away today that will help you um, in your work going forward. So the format's really simple. The guests and I are gonna have a conversation. Um, we're gonna have a chat section and a Q&A section feature that's open. Um, for the chat section, please direct all your technical glitches or issues in that section. My co-chair, Dan Kubiski, will be keeping an eye on that. The Q&A section will be for you guys, the attendees. Um, as we have our discussion, please feel free to type your questions in and we will either um, open up your video and unmute you so you can ask our guests directly, or I'll go ahead and ask them for you. Um, please don't be shy, ask as many questions as you like. This is your opportunity to do that. Um, we also have our raise hand feature. So if you like, if you, we need to find you, please make sure to do the raise hand feature so we can find you and, and, and take handle all those details. Without further ado, I'm going to go into it and introduce our guest. So Will Ripley, he's an award-winning correspondent for CNN. He's based the network's Asia Pacific headquarters in Hong Kong. He's been a journalist Hi. for over... <laughs> Hi, Sorry, Will. I jumped the gun. <laughs> Hi, Al. I know. I was like, okay, that's done. They didn't hear anything else. <laughs> I love it. Well, so Will's been a journalist for over two decades, and he's traveled to North Korea 19 times since 2014. That's more than any American TV correspondent. Um, he's covered breaking news right across the Asia Pacific region. Recently, he's reported on the novel coronavirus from Japan, the devastating bushfires in Australia, and the volcano tragedy in New Zealand. 
He's also a guest anchor for CNN Newsroom Live from CNN's Hong Kong studio and regularly hosts CNN featured programming such as Talk Asia. Um, welcome, Will. We're so glad to have you. See, we could have ended that bio like a minute ago. <laughs> all I know, that stuff I know. is so boring, right? <laughs> There's so much know, news it's happening. It's like all the stuff on my resume before the pandemic just feels like an eternity ago because the whole focus of our job as journalists has shifted. It's just extraordinary. I know. And I can't wait to go deeper in, into that with you because I feel there's a pre-pandemic and a post-pandemic <laughs> when yeah. it comes to the journalism world. And I think speaking to you today will kind of help many of us navigate what to do going forward and the practices that are going to be proper to do so. Although I think I'm just as clueless as, as we all are. I mean, we're just, we're just, we're kind of like life. We're kind of bumbling through it every day trying to figure out how to make it work in this new reality. But it's, um, and that's, that's life, isn't it? Uh, right. Discovering these workarounds. But yeah, it's just, it's just to think that I'm now sitting broadcasting from my living room and like I, you know, I'm regularly doing live shots from home because we've been working from home and I like working from home. I used to write my scripts from home. They used to tell me that I need to go into the office more. So I feel like I was ahead of the curve on that one because I think I can be more creative, but now I don't, you, sometimes you don't have a choice. You actually can't go into the office uh, because they, they limit the number of people in there. Um, I went back for the first time the other day and like, there was like all these sanitiz you know, sanitization stations and you know, you have to wear a mask sitting at your desk. It's just, it's surreal. So does this new normal kind of, what, does it mean freak you out a little bit about what's going to be happening when it comes to reporting? Um, because you're saying all these different measures are, I mean, obviously being taken with well, you know, all these sorts of things. Yeah, we just, you just have to find ways to tell stories in a different way. Like when we were covering the Diamond Princess cruise ship, we did all of our interviews with people on Skype or, you know, or some sort of video um, chat app because we obviously couldn't get on the cruise ship. Now that has prepared us well for telling lots of stories where we don't physically interview people because in this era of social distancing, we have to fill out this huge long form anytime we wanna go on a shoot and actually see somebody face to face inside a building. Um, and so sometimes it's easier and even more effective to, to just do the interview like this. So we've learned how to tell TV pieces using this technology and actually it works pretty well. I mean, um, it, it doesn't bother me at all because the technology is so advanced now. Same thing with doing live shots with an iPhone. I mean, right. you know, you can write your script in the iPhone. You can do your live shot with the iPhone and, and, and it can appear on international television. It's just, it's really mind blowing, but I, you know, it's this, the pandemic has actually caused us to streamline the way that we work and to work in some ways in more efficient ways, um, which is a good thing. Totally. And, I like that you mentioned the phone because I feel as if this big movement for this mojo, the mobile journalism movement, has kind of pushed forward during the pandemic. Um, are you yeah. seeing that a lot more with the work that you're doing now and your colleagues are doing? I mean, the thing is, 20 years ago when I got into the business, something would happen and you would run like a, a map of it. Now it is extraordinarily rare for something to happen and for us not to have video of it because everybody in the world is a journalist, is a video journalist because they all are carrying smartphones and they, and everybody is like savvy enough to take pictures and they might share it on their social. They might send it to CNN or another network. And so, you know, in a sense, we have such a more comprehensive view of the world now than we ever have before. And so um, I only see that, increasing as the technology continues to improve. I mean, it, you know, it's almost professional quality, cinematic quality, some of the stuff that people can do on their phones these days. I know. I've seen some pretty incredible things myself. But yeah. I want to make sure, your, so your career path, it's very impressive. I mean, but did you ever take a moment to reflect when you were in college? It's not that impressive. Texas, <laughs> well, I, I went to a to state differ. school. <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree from a state school. It's either this or Starbucks. <laughs> you know, our, in, our interns now are like getting their doctorate at Yale. I mean, it's incredible. The new generation of journalists are just so smart. And it gives me a lot of hope, actually. Like, you know, the, I think every generation gets smarter and better. I, know, I love hearing that. You know, I think it's so hard, especially now during the pandemic, for especially recent graduates to kind of maneuver how to go forward and what this all means, especially for those that, for example, 
have always dreamed of becoming a foreign correspondent or traveling to do stories. And now they're stuck in a pandemic where that's kind of a restriction. But yeah. I mean, did you ever, when you were in, you, you were working in Colorado, Texas, did you imagine they were going to end up in Hong Kong? And what was that transition, yeah. that path you know, like? So initially, my dream was to host like the Today Show. I imagined myself like next to Katie Couric, like doing a cooking segment. And then in Texas, I hosted a morning show for five years and realized I was so bored, like just bored. And we'd have live reporters and I would have this FOMO because I wanted to be out there on the field with them. And um, at the same time, my news director in Texas gave me an opportunity to do investigative reporting, which allowed me to cross the border more frequently into Mexico to cover um, the drug cartels and illegal immigration. And so that planted the seed for me of working internationally. And I also had a chance on an assignment to meet Anderson Cooper years ago. Uh, we had live shots right next to each other. And also meeting him motivated me to think, you know, I don't want to do a you know, local morning show. I want to go to the network. And so um, I was anchoring like I was anchoring like two hours of news a day. So what is that? Like 10 hours of news a week. And it was, I was all over the TV in this you know, small market, but it was like the number one station. It was one of those like big fish, small pond uh, situations. But I, but I realized sitting behind the anchor desk wasn't giving me enough reporting. Um, so I asked my news director in the last year of my contract to take me off the anchor desk. And everybody thought that I had gotten like, they were like, well, why would you ask that? That's like a demotion. You have to go out and field report and you're not in the studio. And I said, yes. And then within one year, I jumped from South Texas to Denver. And then three years after that, I got to CNN. So once the fire was lit for me, um, I was very, you know, but my, but that wasn't my initial career dream. So I would say sometimes the universe will throw a different option your way. And that the same goes with this pandemic as well. You just have to kind of roll with the punches. You have to be open to things not going exactly as you plan, because maybe there is a better plan out there that's going to work out even better for you. But so short answer, um, no, I never would have thought that I'd be in Hong Kong or, or Tokyo. I actually thought if I was going to be an international you know, co uh, correspondent that I'd be in the Middle East. Um, right. And I have done absolutely zero tours of duty other than like, you know, I was in Turkey for a few weeks. Um, so even, you know, even my international correspondent dream has taken a different turn, but I've gotten to cover North Korea. I've got, I got to cover the early stages of the, of the pandemic um, and a whole host of other really fascinating stories that, you know, the dynamics of the U S and China um, there's so much out here and, uh, and it's, I, it, yeah, it's completely unexpected. So it's great. So you did mention a few of your stories and I feel like as if, a lot of them either high risk locations or high risk stories. Um, do you find yourself prone or attracted to these types of stories that they come to you? Know, you? I don't consider the stories that I'm covering to be particularly high risk, at least in terms of like your physical safety. I mean, there's even in North Korea, yes, you could get detained and you could be get held for a couple of years, but they're probably not going to uh, you know, cut your head off like they would do to a journalist captured in a place like Syria or in Iraq. Um, but there is a mental kind of attack that you go under in places like that. I mean, you know, it's, these societies are very heavy. Um, China is a heavy society. North Korea is an even heavier society. And Hong Kong is now becoming a heavier society. So, um, you do, and you know, we are in protests and all of that, but I mean, the protests in the US, uh, you know, every journalist is experiencing right now what we've been experiencing in Hong Kong for the last year. You know, imagine what, we, what we've been seeing for the last week in the US for six months straight in Hong Kong. It was exhausting. Right. Um, but, but it makes you, you know, you adapt, right? And then you just learn how, you know, you kind of instinctively learn how to navigate these situations. And, and, and so I, I, you know, I wouldn't say high physical risk, but maybe there's a high risk of you could go a little bit crazy if you let yourself. Um, so you have to try to find moments to step back and also to separate yourself from everything that's swirling around you. And that goes with any assignment, really. Right, right. We do have a question that just came in from Sharon Denton. Sharon, we're going to find you. We're going to unmute and get your video so you can ask Will directly your question. Are you there, Sharon? Yeah, can you hear me? Beautiful. Hi, Sharon. Hi, how are you? 
Um, Good. How are you? Oh, just fine. Uh, what time is it there? And is it tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> it is. Gosh, now I'm confused. It's eight sixteen a.m. on Wednesday, June third. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I get. I actually set this whole thing up because I thought I was doing this yesterday. So even after you know six so years bad. out here, I still screw it up. I feel okay. so horrible about that, Will. Okay. Sharon, did you want to ask him your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, China has basically, you know, taken over Hong Kong. Are you seeing a dismantling of the free press in Hong Kong? Or are they still struggling? Or has it been basically closed down? And how do you, how do you manage or navigate that? They haven't taken over it yet uh, in terms of the press freedoms, but we're starting to see the early signs of that. For example, there was a, there was a state broadcaster that was given very serious um, sanctions for critical reporting about the Hong Kong police. And that is how it really starts, right? Um, when you know, critical reporting actually becomes a legal matter and, act, and, and apparently now this could actually be, you know, these sanctions could actually move into the Hong Kong judicial system. And now that they're, you know, China has imposed this national security law, all of those national security standards that allows Beijing to essentially you know, pick up anybody that speaks critically against the government and charge them with, you know, a whole host of uh, what we would consider to be illegitimate uh, charges. Or, you know, Beijing's been known to kidnap people and force them to make a confession. All of the laws that allow that to happen in mainland China are now going to be allowed, that will be allowed to happen here in Hong Kong, even if it is the Hong Kong government technically doing the the enforcing. Um, So like, for example, uh, the press... The press is not being silenced. It's not being censored. We're not seeing the, you know, the, the, the image cut to black. But I, I would imagine that as things start to move forward, and, and especially the domestic media, the local media here, um, starts to see how things are operate, you could have a self-censorship you know, situation, which is not unusual in authoritarian countries. Look what's happening in the Philippines, where uh, you know, a, a leading broadcaster, uh, you know, ABC, CBN, um, mm-hmm. was was basically their license wasn't renewed or there's been this really long delay and it knocked them off the air. And that was absolutely a retribution from the Duterte administration for their critical coverage of him. So, you know, I, I, it makes me sad. Um, and we're, we're going to continue to do our jobs, uh, you know, as best we can here. But if there ever comes a point that we feel that Hong Kong is not a viable place from which we can freely report, I mean, there's a reason why our, our Asia hub is here in Hong Kong and not in Beijing. Because, you know, when we hire local journalists, we don't want them to be at risk of being arrested for a critical report. And we don't know if that's going to happen here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And also, we, she wanted to know, are you multilingual? Uh, you know, I speak, yes, I speak a hodgepodge of, of languages, including English, by the way. Uh, I speak a little bit of English. <laughs> um, I speak some Spanish. I uh, speak a little bit of Japanese, a little bit. I've basically picked up enough that I can culturally make people feel more at ease with me. But I, but when I'm in a country where it's not my, where it's not English, I do always have a translator. Except I did an assignment for a few days in Spain with an all Spanish speaking crew and no translator, and I uh, and I was able to do that. Now that the Spanish does me a whole lot of good uh, out here, but you know, I, I wish that I had taken more time to learn all the languages fluently in the different countries that I've been based in. And I, that's a, a piece of advice that I often give people. If there's an area that you really want to specialize in, uh, try to learn the language because it does, it, it's very important. Um, and I would, see, I would say that you can still do your job and you can still connect with people if you don't right. speak your language, but you have to work a lot harder to truly, really try to understand the culture. I agree with you. I think when you have uh, like a translator or a fixer, it kind of breaks that direct connection that you can have with that person right. if you want to do that with no and you just language. and that's that's why eye contact that's why empathy all of the things that are important are a hundred times more important because if if you're speaking to someone and you're not speaking their language they need to still know that they can trust that you're that you're gonna care about them and tell their story and you can do that through the way that through the questions you ask and the way that you the way that you look at them the way that you listen and uh, and respect them absolutely I know, Dan, you had a question. Did you want to come in and ask your question to Will? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the threats to free press in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, Part of the roundup of Democratic uh, leaders in Hong Kong included uh, Jimmy Lai, uh, 
who owns Apple Daily. H has that kind of attack on such a major person had an impact on how Hong Kong journalists are looking at what's going on in their city? N not in terms of our editorial coverage. We're still covering it just as critically and objectively. Um, what we are, <clears throat> what everybody has in the back of their mind is what happens when my visa comes up? Because usually when, you know, it's China tried, you know, sending men in black suits and knocking on doors and intimidating journalists. And that didn't go so well for them because Western news organizations would report when that kind of thing would happen. But one thing that they can do and are doing is they don't renew visas or they even revoke visas uh, as, a, as a, you know, because of stories or coverage that they've deemed critical. And um, that has already happened here in Hong Kong. So, you know, because we are not, you know, because we're here essentially at, at the pleasure of the Hong Kong government, if, you know, the first thing that they're going to do is go into that, into that immigration office and start um, taking visas away from organizations, the number of people that they can have working for them, and individual journalists even if they're, if they're unhappy with the coverage. But that's not shaping, you know, or, or impacting how we cover. Now, in terms of the local press, um, again, I think this is still kind of uncharted territory, but the local press is still pretty um, defiant in, in their mission. Um, and I hope that that doesn't change, you know, because the spirited free press, as we know, is a cornerstone. This is not a democracy here, but, but, but Hong Kong is this kind of weird hybrid system. And there's a lot of people that wish that they could choose their own leaders. They can only choose their local leaders here. The others are kind of handpicked, but they take that, they take that right that they're given very seriously. And the press covers this territory very objectively for now. Awesome. So I know earlier you mentioned um, the riots in Hong Kong and you've also done pandemic coverage. I did have some clips to show everyone so we can kind of discuss it and you can give us the thought process of what went into that story and we can kind of dig deeper sure. into those. So I'm going to go ahead and share that screen with you guys. Okay. Let's see. So we have here, because I know you mentioned earlier, a lot of people were comparing the protests that are going now in here in the United States to the ones that are going on in Hong Kong. And, yeah. you know, this has been going on for so long. And I'm bringing up one of the stories that you worked on right here for everyone to view really quickly. Let's see if this works. So, so this is when the protester was hit with a live round, right? Right, I believe so. So we're gonna go ahead and play it right now. It's hard to hear, so maybe we can just kind of talk sure. about this. Um, sure. Who would have known that, you know, at that time that those gas masks would be far more prevalent in our new COVID, uh, COVID reality? Right. Yeah, so um, look, things got really, really hairy in Hong Kong last year. I mean, it was, it was a very tense um, difficult situation. And what I, what struck me the most was, you know, we as journalists cannot, can get trapped in that expat bubble, right? Like the neighborhood that you live in is where a lot of other foreigners live and they're business people. And so I was hearing people in my immediate circle kind of griping about the protests and saying, Oh, you know, these protests, can't things just get back to normal. But when I went out into the city, and I talked to people who are from Hong Kong, overwhelmingly, people were in support of the protest. They felt it had to happen. They were angry with the government. And you saw that reflected in the results of the local elections, where it was like this overwhelming landslide for pro-democracy uh, parties, despite the economic damage and the shutdown of the MTR stations and the, and the inconvenience on life. Hong Kongers really felt that the protests were, were necessary. Now, now that this national security law is in place and the penalties become exponentially greater, I do wonder if 
I, I, I do believe that fewer people are going to take that risk now to go out and, and engage in acts of civil disobedience. I, I don't think that yeah. China is going to send the PLA, you know, out marching into the streets, but they could have, they could put, you know, people into the Hong Kong police force who take far more um, aggressive tactics than even what we've seen when, uh, with that story that you just showed where somebody was shot with a live round. You know, the reason why that person was shot with a live round of ammunition is because it was actually an untrained officer who's not normally in protest situations and, you know, was, was surrounded by people and they were throwing stuff and felt intimidated. And that's when they fired their, their gun. They had fired guns, they had fired live rounds, but they hadn't hit anybody several times before that. So you make um, it sound kind of like in Hong Kong, they know how to protest. It's almost like a, because it's been going on for so long, people have no, know the nuances to it. And well, 2014, you know. the umbrella revolution, when, when Hong Kong police used tear gas in 2014, that was a shock to everybody in this city because they, because that had never happened. The umbrella protests, I mean, they were, they set up like little, um, you know, learning tents and like food refreshment stations and, you know, all of Admiralty was occupied, but it was very tidy. There was no violence, uh, you know, you know, no significant violence. Hong Kong protesters were so polite and really, you know, lovely, but it has, the protests have ta taken a, you know, kind of a darker turn and setting things on fire. Um, you know, some people have started to, you know, create these improvised explosive devices. So I do, I am fearful that even if the numbers of protesters goes down, that those who have centered their identity around the fight, uh, I, I, I'm fearful for them and what that looks like and what that means, uh, you know, moving forward. And how about the journalists that were covering um, the protests in Hong Kong? What does that look like going forward when you're thinking about we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's all these different elements and kind of kinks to the wheel that come into play? Are these yeah, things I mean, that we, you think about? We, well, we no longer deploy, like we have limits on, the, on the, the size of our team that can be out at once. So we can't have, you know, a small army of people uh, deployed at once. I think we, the, the limit is like eight people, which is essentially two crews. You have correspondent, photographer, um, security, and producer. And you have two, crew, you know, two teams of four. And other people that might have been out in the field with us before are now, you know, either from home or in the newsroom monitoring live feeds and you know, sending information on a, you know, on SMS to a shared alias, so that we all are seeing in real time these updates. And then we're sending in our pictures and our video to the to this group as well. It's a WhatsApp group, and 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 that's how we're able to share, you know, information in a much more efficient way than even like emails or anything. But like the the, the number of people on the streets news gathering is going to be smaller. And then you you know you you have hand sanitizer, you are wearing your face masks, you still have your gas masks. I mean, all the other safety protocols. And then you add on top of that, the pandemic protocols. I'd love to get your perspective on what you're thinking is when you're seeing the protests that are taking place here in the U.S. Because I know a lot of people were comparing it to the ones in Hong Kong by the severity of it. I think I read this morning where I think the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker announced that there was about 190 or more cases, attacks against journalists that were taking place just in the last few days. And that's in comparison to like, that's the number that you, they would probably see in a year. Um, what are your thoughts? Like, what are, you, what are you seeing from there in Hong Kong? What's the sentiment there? Um, you personally, having covered prote protests in Hong Kong, yeah. how are you feeling seeing all this? I, I, you know, look, I never was that shocked or, you know, overwhelmed by the protests in Hong Kong. I thought the Hong Kong police on the whole were pretty polite. I mean, I was tear gassed once, but that's because I put myself in a spot where that would happen. I've never been hit with um, a rubber bullet. Um, I've never been put in handcuffs. When I was in Istanbul, I had a police officer because I, I took a picture of a police officer at a protest in Istanbul, a, a protest by the Kurds. And um, he grabbed my phone from me. He cussed at me. He said he would kick my, you know what, if I didn't delete the video clip and he'd arrest me and throw me in jail for 30 days or 15 days or whatever it was, I was shaking. I was terrified of this police officer. And it's the only time in my career that I've ever agreed to delete video because this, it wasn't that important of, of a piece of video that it was worth, you know, taking a stand. And, um, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to get locked up. So I was far more intimidated in Turkey than I've ever been in Hong Kong. But, you know, when I saw some of the stuff, when I saw what president Trump did, where he deployed, you know, 
on peaceful protesters deployed the, you know, the federal forces in a, in a, in a violent manner with tear gas and whatnot against people who were not, they were peacefully protesting. And just to clear them out quickly, they did that so he could stand in front of a church and hold the Bible. That was shocking to me because that actually reminded me more of what I, the kind of stuff that I would see in a place like Turkey right. than what I'm seeing here in Hong Kong. Now, so, you know, it's as an American journalist, you know, we, we tend to go quite hard on the Hong Kong police every time that there's an incident. And there, there are incidents of brutality and police definitely overreacting and physical violence and stuff. And we have to, but, you know, you also have in the back of your mind, gosh, but all of the stuff that I'm seeing happening in the United States, how, how is, you know, the United States is criticizing, you know, this approach, but yet we're seeing, you know, that approach there. So it's, um, yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting time to be an American and to look at our country from, uh, you know, out outside, you know, so I'm not, I'm not in the middle of it and I get to kind of step back and I also get to hear what people from other countries are saying and the questions they're asking and the things that they're thinking. And it really has been eye opening and fascinating and sometimes heartbreaking. So, um, so what are, what and, are people telling you and asking you and the responses to what's going on here? You know, um, well, for, you know, example, businessman from Nigeria absolutely loves president Trump. A lot of Chinese people love President Trump because they celebrate his wealth. And they think, gosh, this guy's a billionaire. He must be doing something right. He's strong. You know, but then you have my European or Australian friends who are just like, what the heck is happening there? And how, you know, is it, is it, is it possible he could be reelected? I said, yes, it's very possible. You know, and people are kind of shocked. Um, I think the most kind of thought-provoking comment was from a, the ambassador, in, uh, uh, ambassador for Singapore who told me, um, you know, very, very matter of factly, he said, you know, America was a country that we all wanted to be, you know, we wanted to be America. He said, now America is a country that we watch and we learn from. And, wow. you know, and, and, that, and that's a big change. That it really, it's amazing how in a few years that it's like a complete 180 almost yeah and it was already happening i mean it's not just but it has accelerated i would say it certainly right. has accelerated um and you know but yeah it just like just like the people's people's you know political views are so diverse everywhere in the world we are living in a polarized world um and so depending on how you think that the world should look you're either in one camp or the other and people increasingly are kind of really you know just kind of digging, digging their heels in in their camps. Okay, looks like we have a question from Peter. Peter, we're gonna unmute you so you can ask Will your question. You're gonna have to give us, are you there, Peter? Technology gods are in our favor. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi, my name is Peter. I am a student journalist from Hungary. Thanks and, for joining, Peter. And as I know, you've heard a lot as an intern. So my first question is, what are your advice for us? And my second question is, how can we imagine a simple working day at CNN? How are you writing scripts? And for example, can you edit your videos? Or, or have yeah. you got an editor? Or... Sure. So first part of your question, I, um, I have a cardinal rule. I am never rude to an intern because that intern in five years could very, very easily be my boss. Like I said, <laughs> our interns are like Ivy League, like brainiacs who just blow me away with how much knowledge is pulsing through their veins. They don't. They might not have this, you know, the, the practical experience that I have. Because journalism, I I believe, is a trade. So it's not like it's not like becoming a doctor or a lawyer where you get this degree and this degree and there's a cert, a set path. Anybody can be a journalist. We talked about it earlier. Anybody with a phone that takes a piece of video can be a journalist. Um, so journalism is a trade, and you learn it as you go. So um, my advice for interns is to learn every single job in the newsroom that you can. I've actually done every job in a newsroom throughout my career. I've, I've run the assignment desk. I've run the teleprompter. I've edited video. I've shot um, video. I've done live shots. 
Um, I have cleaned up the newsroom. I've gone and gotten people's, when I was an intern, I went and got people's dinner and their dry cleaning. And then in between, I got a chance to write, you know, maybe a 15 second script here and there. Um, so I would say that if you have an internship, do your mundane tasks that are assigned to you, but then look for every opportunity to kind of, if it's allowed, and hopefully it is, stay late and, you know, job shadow other people in roles that you find interesting and meet everybody, meet everybody that you think you could be worth keeping in touch with. Because like we had an intern, uh, we had an intern in Beijing um, who I worked with when I was in Beijing on a, on a multiple week assignment. And, you know, he stayed in touch and I was able in New York, we were both in New York at the same time. And I introduced him to some people that helped him to get a job eventually at CBS, uh, not at CNN, unfortunately, because I was hoping we could hire, hire him. But the point is, is that your internship is going to open doors. It's going to get you in the door. And that's the most important first step. You know, you have to get your foot in the door. Um, so learn every single job, even if it's not something that you think you'd be interested in because you want to be, yes, you want to be a specialist and you want to, you know, really know, uh, you know, certain areas really, really, really well, because that's journalists are really valuable when they're a specialist, but it's also, I think, valuable to have an understanding of how the operation works and just try to really, you know, because, you know, sometimes, otherwise you're in a situation where you're working in television or in print and you don't actually know the nuts and bolts of how this is all happening. Um, now, granted, it's all changing. So I'm not, I'm, you know, it's, it's all social, digital, whatever. Like, I'm not, I don't really know the nuts and bolts like I used to, but um, I still have a pretty fundamental basic sense of how a news organization operates. And, and that started with my internship. Um, and, and just as you talk about working at CNN someday, those people who you meet in your internship, whether it's at CNN or whatever, that's going to be critical in getting you placed at, you know, because there's a lot of competition for jobs. And so it really does boil down in many cases to, do you know somebody who can send an email to someone and kind of push your resume to the top of the digital pile? Because a lot of the resumes, you, you submit them on, online now, and then you never know necessarily if anybody even looked at it. How do you stand out in that kind of environment? So that's why it's still these, you know, these relationships that you're going to build in your internship are crucial. Thank you so much for your question, Peter. I hope that was good for you so valuable. I feel like one of the most important relationships, interns, you know, always being good with them. Also, I, I kind of want to touch on mentors. I think mentorship is such yes. an important thing too. I think for yes. me going forward, my most important relationships were mentors and, you know, paying that back afterwards, you know, you need, you need to get people invested in your career. Um, and especially at a big network like CNN, you have to have even, you know, somebody in my position, somebody in any position, you need to have somebody who cares about your career and is there to kind of guide you, you know, to somebody you can bounce thoughts and ideas off of, and also somebody that can, you know, make sure that you're a part of the conversation when there's a job, you know, being discussed or a promotion being discussed that, um, you know, Hey, you know, Elle's doing a really great job there. We should, you know, consider her for this. And so again, it, you know, the interpersonal relationships are so crucial. It's a, it's a huge part of what we do. And um, in some ways, it's, 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 it's just as important and just as valuable as the quality of your journalism. Right. As, you know, kind of, you know, if you want to kind of build your career, it's about growing your career. You know, so I find like a lot of that throughout my career was in person, you know, the in-person interaction you have with these people now. And I think what, what kind of tips we have now, now that there's a pandemic and maybe those personal experiences where you would have with like a mentor or other interns, you may not have that. Like what kind of recommendations you would, would you give to interns to kind of mitigate that a little bit? Just try to do what exactly what we're doing right now, you know, schedule video chats on zoom or whatever. Um, you know, schedule time to have a conversation at least once with the big boss of your bureau and to just kind of pick their brain and get them on your side. And, you know, these are things that you would prefer to do in person, but if you have to do it over video, then, Hey, I mean, we haven't actually met L, but I feel like with all the messages we've been exchanging and now chatting on video, I feel warmth for you. Like, you know, you can always message me and, you know, if you need something. And so look, I mean, we, it, our definition might slightly change in terms of like personal relationships, but at the end, it's still the same. It's right. whether whatever technology is piled onto it, it's still the same ingredients. You know, it's, it's, it's building a connection and following through. 
making sure, you know, because remember these people are busy. So you've got to be the one to reach out and stay in touch. Don't expect that they're going to necessarily remember, but don't, you know, don't be obnoxious about it, but you know, right. do it just enough and you'll get a sense of, of the, of the balance. Um, and just make sure that the, those people always know that you haven't, you haven't forgotten how grateful you are for their guidance and you can send them updates, you know, periodically as your career climbs, because even, you know, years down the road, they might be the person who can tell a hiring manager, oh yeah, you should totally give out uh, another look. She's great, you know? Awesome. So it looks like we have another question from Vincent. Vincent, we're gonna get you on the line. Hi there. Hi Vincent. Hi Vincent. Hi. So I'm um, currently a student. I don't actually work in journalism right now. Um, I'm moving into the journalism field after my undergrad. Um, and, you know, when I was an undergrad, I kind of realized that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, because of that, I kind of have a very small understanding of how broad journalism can be. Um, so I, right now I want to focus on, you know, American political journalism and really kind of highlight that more so than it already is. Um, but, you know, from Will, your experience was I wanted to work in daytime TV and then, you know, I realized, oh, that's not, <laughs> not the case anymore. Um, so how did you deal like with the that? I'm, I'm working in the opposite of daytime TV. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and so how did you deal with that shifting your career and kind of realizing, like, that's what I want to do? And then, of course, ending up, you know, in a whole different country, in a whole different time zone than yeah. family, friends, et cetera, you know, and, you know, kind of really. Well, in a, in a way, Vincent, I feel like, you have already answered your own question because you decided midway through undergrad that you wanted to become a journalist. And I just salute you for being willing to make that change because I believe that if, if you enjoy your job, if you, if you love what you're doing, it's not going to feel like work, even when the hours suck and the pay sucks and everything, you know, because journalists are not well paid, especially in the early years. I ate ramen noodles and had so much credit card debt and I worked like overnights and weekends, but I loved it. Oh my God. I loved it so much. And if you're doing something that makes you feel that way, then you are doing the right thing. Um, and so first of all, bravo for being willing to, to make a shift. Now you're, you know, obviously, uh, yeah, politics are the be all and end all. And, you know, people who have contacts and sources in DC are like gold for news organizations. Anybody who can break a story and get it ahead of the New York Times and the Washington Post, they're gonna snatch them up, they're gonna pay them a lot of money. So it's a great thing to study. But if you find something else down the road that really fascinates you, um, don't be afraid to, uh, um, to change course again, and again, and again, and again. I mean, I, yeah, I absolutely had no clue that I would end up out here in Asia, because if I knew I would have, I would have studied Japanese and Korean and all the languages that are spoken out here. I found out, that I was moving to Tokyo sight unseen like two months before it happened. I mean, I, got, I bought Rosetta Stone and was like, you know, studying up. But that, I mean, I had so little preparation. I was not an expert. I was not a specialist. And that's exactly why they hired me because they wanted a fresh set of eyes. They wanted somebody to take a different approach than somebody who's a specialist. So you could go into a story like DC and take a totally different approach that could work really, really well for you in your career. Um, so just, you know, make your plan, put in your work, plant the seeds of your success, but also divorce yourself from the outcome a little bit so that if it doesn't go exactly as you envisioned, it could still be an amazing career and you're, and you're just, your work is relevant and it matters. And it's just not exactly what you thought you'd be doing, but it's still fantastic. Amazing. Thank you, Vincent, for your question. Thank you. <sighs> awesome. Thank you all for that. Um, I kind of want to direct us towards the pandemic coverage that you've done because I think okay. um, one thing that I did notice when you were, you were in Japan earlier this year, correct? And, three and a half months. Wow. So, and then you, when you were yeah. in Japan, you were covering, were you there to cover the pandemic or were you there prior to all this so, announcement? Yeah. So 2020 started, I was in Australia covering the bushfires as the pandemic was spreading. So, uh, you know, I would see... The, the news updates out of China, but my focus was on climate change and these huge fires burning in Australia. And that was just, you know, I was there for a couple of weeks covering that. And then I got back in Hong Kong and jumped into the pandemic coverage. And I remember thinking, 
gosh, it's a real overkill that Hong Kong has shut down its border with China right away. Like, and I did a piece like showing how the high speed rail line and, you know, all these things have been shut down and, you know, they're making transit much more difficult. So then I got a call to go to Japan to cover the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And I frankly thought it'd be a week long trip max. I thought, okay, there are people on a cruise ship. I'll be there for a week. Um, but then we watched, you know, as this cruise ship became like an incubator and the thing was spreading so quickly and it kind of taught all of us like, wow, this is really contagious. And there's, you know, there ended up being 700 and, you know, 12 or 714 cases on the ship. And, um, and so then when it started to become clear that the pandemic was going to affect the Olympics, then my trip got extended as we were waiting for an announcement about the Olympics. Um, and then, um, uh, after the Olympics announcement was made, then Japan's numbers were starting to really tick up. And actually, as it turned out, Japan didn't have that big of numbers, partly because they didn't ever really test a lot of people. But um, yeah, I mean, so I spent, I've spent the majority of this pandemic in one country, in Japan, um, because, because of the travel restrictions, it was hard to get anybody else in. Um, and uh, it was, you know, it was, it was actually very satisfying to cover it there because I did live in Japan for four years and the life of an international correspondent. When I was based in Japan, I was never in Japan consecutively for three and a half months, the whole four years oh. that I was based there. I was in North Korea. I was in China. I was all over the world. I think I traveled to like 30 or 40 countries in those four years oh. for CNN. Um, and so I felt more of a connection in some ways with Japan, this most recent trip, then I was able to feel, even when I lived there, I got to see the entire Sakura season from start to finish for the first time ever. Um, so it was actually it professionally, and you know, you're covering a story that matters to the people who are your friends and neighbors there. I mean, that was one thing I found really satisfying about local news is that you cover a story and, it, and it, it's relevant in the community that you live in. And I've now had that same satisfaction, both covering the pandemic in Japan and also covering the protests uh, here in Hong Kong, because you know, the story that I'm covering for the first time in my international news career actually matters to my friends and neighbors and my family here in Hong Kong. Um, and so you feel even more invested in it. Uh, and, I, and I really like that. And so when you got the note that you were going to be going back to Hong Kong, this was when travel was restricted, correct? And, or limited, should I say? Right. Yeah. And I remember seeing that you documented your journey back from Japan to Hong Kong. Um, I yeah, had the yeah. clip, but we're going to share it with you guys afterwards um, in a follow-up so you guys can see it and hear it. But Will you did a probably, fantastic you, job. You can, you can play it and we can talk over sure, it. Sure, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. I'll um, go ahead and share that so you guys can see it and then maybe Will, you can... But, um, yeah, as long as I can still talk over it because the audio is pretty low. But yeah, I mean, I just had the thought... I walked I'll, into I'll the play it without the audio so that you can discuss it. Yeah. How about that? I walked into Narita Airport and it was so ghostly empty in the middle of the day. I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to like take a video of this. And that's how I just kind of started just very simply documenting, um, you know, documenting my trip back and started with the empty airport and then the empty, this is different. I think this is a go there video that we shot about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. So, I mean, I just was shooting stuff on my phone and like I showed, yeah, like arriving in Hong Kong and then, you know, putting on my electronic wristband and sitting in quarantine. And it was such a, you know, a trip that normally would take me like five hours, took me close to a day by the time I actually made it, you know, out of government custody because I had to get tested for COVID. I had to test, um, negative, um, and then I had to like fill out all this quarantine paperwork. And so it just, what it, what it showed me is that travel currently is really, unless it's absolutely essential, is really not feasible for right. the vast majority of people. Because who can do that? Who can go through two weeks of quarantine every time they need to return back into the, the country where they live in? And then keep in mind, really, once I left Japan, I, I now cannot return. So if I, even if I wanted to travel, Wow. The, the number of countries that I could actually travel to right now, aside from the United States, is very small. Um, and and when I, if you know if I do go back to the U.S. to visit my family or whatever, I might have to do another two week quarantine again coming back into Hong Kong. So that causes you to kind of postpone, uh, you know, so you any trips that are not, not absolutely too, essential. You? Yeah, just a few days ago. Yeah, <laughs> I'll um, 
you can bring me back up full. I'll show everybody sure. my. So they gave me this, they gave me this electronic um, wristband, wow. right? And so for two weeks, I'm wearing this thing and I'm thinking, you know, it's going to beep at some point and I'm going to get, you know, if I like, if I stray, you know, uh, you know, around my apartment in some weird area that's not covered, like there's sort of police knocking at my door. Right. I never got a phone call. I got one phone call at the beginning saying, hey, just to inform you, you have a two week quarantine. I wore the, the, the wristband and at the end they say you can, you can cut the thing off. But then I realized I could slide the wristband off and it's like attached <laughs> to your cell phone. So I was like, man, it really is in some ways honor system. Even with the wristband, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously it's not a foolproof system, but who wants to be the person who brought community spread of coronavirus back to Hong Kong from their trip? So you just got to do it. Totally. It wasn't fun, but yeah. So that kind of dictates, I mean, if you think about, if you want to be a foreign correspondent, and you're the, the kind of person that travels from country to country, that kind of limits you now, doesn't it? When you want to think about. For, yeah. That. I mean, one of the, one of the allures of this job was the travel, but I will say you know, the, the travel is also a curse. Living out of a suitcase mm-hmm. is kind of fabulous and glamorous for the first few years. And then you start to be like, gosh, this is like my fourth birthday that I've spent in North Korea, or, you know, I've had to cancel these plans. My friends don't even re- you know, remember what I look like. Um, and that takes a toll over time. So again, yes, I'm not traveling right now. My, I'm sure my airline and hotel status is just, you know, doomed for the year, but you know, I get to spend more time at home. I get to see people, you know, I get to see friends. Normally nobody's ever here in Hong Kong during the summer. People always get out of town because it's really hot, but everybody's stuck here. So, you know, you're, you're getting together with friends on a regular basis. You're going to the beach, you're doing more hikes, you know, you're taking advantage of, of the place that you live. Um, in a way that you wouldn't have done when you had the freedom to travel. And so I hope that we can all kind of look at it in a positive way like that and not feel, you know, so trapped or, you know, because you could totally feel that way. You could feel really negative about it or you can just accept it and be like, okay, this is not exactly what I envisioned, but you can find the, you know, you can find the joy in it. All about your perspective. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so we're, we're in a pandemic. We've had so many things happen, I think, within the last, since the beginning of the year that I personally can't wrap my mind around it as a journalist. Um, And I like the fact that we're kind of segueing into this notion of, you know, as foreign correspondents and people that are always traveling to, to cover a story, this is a moment for us to take a step back and really think about, like, for example, mental health, take a moment to enjoy time with family. What are some things that yes. you're doing that you could give as tips to other journalists that, cause I think as journalists, we're always on and sometimes yeah. finding that balance can be hard. Unplug. I mean, just force yourself to put down the phone and turn off the television and get your eyes away from the screen and get yourself out into nature or meditation or music or swimming exercise. I mean, whatever it is, but unplug, man, because if you don't, you are going to get kind of consumed by the, by the, you know, frantic energy that is the news cycle of our life, of our, you know, 2020. I mean, even I thought 2019 was great. 2020 just takes us to a whole new level. So, you know, if you get, if you allow yourself to get all keyed in, it can, it can, you know, it can be very bad for you. So uh, (laughs) unplug, unplug, take your time off. You know, don't sacrifice, even if you can't travel, take the time and do other stuff and make sure you get every day that's owed to you. Um, Get rest, you know, find, you know, recharge, um, all that stuff. Just protect your mental health and your mindfulness and all that, all that jazz. Awesome. So we have a question um, from Dan. Hey, Dan. Hey there. Hi, Dan. Uh, um, This will be the first year since uh, 1990 that there has not been a commemorative march for the uh, massacre at Tiananmen. And they're using uh, COVID-19 as the excuse for not allowing it. Right. Um, Not to sound like a conspiracy freak, but do you see something a little more in that? And what kind of feedback are you getting from the people you talk to in Hong Kong about the cancellation of this very important event in Hong Kong? Yeah. I mean, uh, 
there is a rule that people, you know, can't gather in groups larger than eight, without, which obviously is advantageous to a government that's trying to stop protests from disrupting the city. Um, we, we are not entirely sure what to expect for tomorrow's anniversary because this is uncharted territory. Normally there's a big gathering, as you said, in Hong Kong. Um, it's, the only, it's the only territory in China that has a, comm a, you know, a commemoration of Tiananmen Square and this will be the first year that that doesn't happen. But what the organizers are encouraging people to do is to commemorate from their homes, to commemorate in smaller groups. And so we're gonna be all, I'm frankly, um, fascinated to see what this looks like tomorrow. I hope that it is ins inspirational and not, you know, it turn descending into violence. Um, it will make me sad if we see on the Tiananmen anniversary, the water cannons and the tear, you know, the tear gas and the rubber bullets and everything else. Um, but that's probably a likely possibility, but there probably also will be a large number of people who do it in a peaceful way. And, you know, will they do it out their windows? Will they go to hiking trails and, and you know, and shine their, shine their, their phone lights like we've, se like we've seen done in previous protests? I mean, there, it might be a mixture of symbolism and also, uh, you know, potentially clashes with police. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen yet. But as far as conspiracy theories, I, I mean, look, it's no secret that Beijing was really ticked off pretty much ever since 2014. Uh, they did not like that Admiralty shut down for, you know, more than 70 days. Uh, you know, they don't like that, that civilian protesters have had the power to kind of like cause the government to, you know, to, to, you know, fall back on, on public policy that Beijing wants. And when Beijing's patience dried up, they just said, okay, well then we're just going to, we're just going to do it ourselves because the Hong Kong government hasn't been able to get it done. So yeah, what we're going to see now is essentially China being able to swoop in and defy the will of the people, which they have, you know, they, under an authoritarian system, they, they're, that is what they do. And that's what they've been doing for a long time. And why do you think that the U.S. should care or the folks in the U.S. should care about what's going on in this situation? Well, I mean, I, I think people in the U.S. should watch, should watch the rise of authoritarian leaders very closely. Uh, you know, I mean, the fact that you have you know, Putin and Xi and Duterte and, um, you know, all of the other kind of, all of these other leaders around the world who are, who are, who are, you know, moving away from a, who are flat out rejecting the messiness of democracy in favor of a one party, you know, one approach sweep through, you know, in the Philippines, let's just kill all the, you know, let's kill all the street level drug thugs without giving them a trial because, you know, we're at, you know, the streets are safer for it. So what if you're, you know, killing people without even giving them, you know, a chance for rehabilitation or anything like that? I mean, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the messiness of democracy kind of play out. And then we're seeing these, you know, China, you know, for example, their, their coronavirus response. I mean, they were able to lock down close to a billion people wow. in a matter of weeks. And they had, you know, I mean, even if you don't trust their numbers, they couldn't hide 100,000 deaths in China. So you've got a country of 1.4 billion people with, you know, a tiny fraction of the deaths that you have in the United States, a country, of, you know, 300 million plus. Um, you know, and it's because this authoritarian government was able to take away people's individual freedoms, force them to stay home, not ask them or request them, force them to stay home. Um, but then you have, you know, but then you have a country like Japan where they just requested that people stay home. They didn't force anybody to do anything, but everybody kind of wears masks and, you know, keeps their distance. And, and the numbers in Japan and the number of deaths has been very low. So maybe there's a happy medium in between. Um, and I think that Americans would, we, would, it would be good for them to look, it'd be good for them to look at what happens here in Hong Kong because Americans need to ask themselves the question, are they comfortable with a government that can just, to a big sweeping approach like that, which isn't, which is not what our country is all about, or, you know, is there a happy medium? Do we need to be as divided as have to be one way or the other, or can we kind of, can we kind of all work together and be, you know, and work better with each other? Um, Cause it's, I don't know, you just see everything that's happening and it's, and, and there, there really is no, there's no system that's perfect, right? 
But I still believe that when I step foot home in the US, there is a different feeling. There's a feeling of, it's a place that you wanna be. And people from China, students from China, students from Russia, they go to the US and most of them love it because they're like, wow, like you have this sense that you have this opportunity and this, you, know, you really do have the freedom to kind of you know, chase your dreams. And it makes me sad to see protesters, peaceful protesters getting targeted by federal authorities in front of the White House because I feel like that kind of dampens that, that, that light that our country has, that makes it feel like a special place. Um, even despite the fact that it's messy and it's a melting pot and everything, you know, you get all cultures from all over the world, you're gonna have conflict, you're gonna have difficulty, but there's just this something special, something special in the United States. And I think we should really try to preciously guard that. And I think people in Hong Kong are out protesting because they felt like there's something really special in this city that they wanna try to protect as well. And they're afraid that if it just becomes like any other mainland China city, that over time, it's, you're no longer going to feel that kind of that spark and that freedom that you feel when, you, when you're here in Hong Kong. And it's already changing, frankly. That was very well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I'll send you your check later in the mail. <laughs> oh, you're awesome. So one thing we do ask um, all of our guests, we want to know, what does press freedom mean to you? Well, press freedom means, as a journalist on the front lines, to be able to go into an editorial meeting, make my story pitch, and maybe it doesn't get approved every time, but at least I know that there's really no story out of bounds that I can't try to convince my editors to let me work on. And then to be able to go out and do that story and write it and craft it the way that I feel is objective and it needs to be told and to not then have somebody in the editing process completely fundamentally change my reporting. It doesn't mean that my reporting is necessarily always the best way or the right way to do it, but that's how a free press works. It's a bunch of journalists, individuals, who are seeing the world through their journalist's eyes, and they're telling it to the best of their ability or with their, you know, through their prism, and then all these different voices combine. And if, you're, if, you're, if your news organization is doing its job, it should have journalists from a diverse group of backgrounds. Every single background you can think of, you should have a reporter, if you can, that represents that somehow. Because then, you know, that's reflective of your community. And you're telling stories that make it into the end product. And yes, they are edited and they're, you know, they're, you know, shuffled around by people. But in the end of the day, you have a diverse, you know, colorful view and a critical view of what's happening. Um, and you, there's not a memo being handed down saying, this is what the Politburo says you need to focus on today. This is how you need to say this. I mean, I, you know, I have friends who are anchors for state run TV channels, and I won't say, you know, which one it is, but you know, these are channels that hire Westerners, um, you know, they hire Westerners to have a Western face presenting the state, you know, the state spin on the news. And they're not even allowed to say anything that's off the teleprompter. They can't, change a word. And that's the same for news presenters in a lot of these countries. You know, they have to stick to the script. Whereas on CNN, most of our programming is like unscripted. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, you know, you, you write your stories and everything, but a lot of this, you know, back and forth and these questions and everything, this is all unscripted and it's just, um, you know, so, you know, a show host is going to, is going to be able to, you know, go in the direction that they want to take their show and they might have a different viewpoint from the next hour but I think that that's, that's freedom, you know, that's freedom of the press in action. Well, that was incredible. I feel like that went by in the blink of an eye. Um, it's just so because every, I talk too much. No, it's, it's already, I, have we already hit our I time feel like we could talk for hours. I, I want to listen to all your stories and hopefully we can have you back because I've, there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. I mean, you've so many stories and things that you've done throughout your career. I feel like so many of us can learn from, and we'd love to hear more about you know, just the span of Thank your you. career. So, you know, I, yeah, but I will say this, I'll, you know, I don't dwell a whole lot on what I've done. I'm thinking about what I'm doing now and what I'm going to do, you know, moving forward, because that is journalism. That's life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're just always, you're only as good as your last story. So, you know, yeah, there's been a lot of cool stuff that's happened and I'm grateful for all of it. And it helps build you into the journalist you are, but at the end of the day, you've got today and you've got tomorrow and, and then the next day, hopefully, and you know, you got to keep, uh, <laughs> hopefully keep your job. Amazing. 
So thank you everyone for joining us. I don't want to keep everyone for too long. Um, Will, thank you so much. And, and um, Will, thank you. Uh, I just want to jump in and say thank you very much. You're in my favorite city and I'm dying to get back there. <laughs> well, hopefully you can come here and not have to quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> Whenever I was go. there for SARS, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know things went back to normal after SARS, right? So I think yeah. that you know, right. but we'll all have the we'll all have the knowledge, and we'll all be germaphobes a little bit more. Right, right. So for those that are tuned in, I'm going to make a quick announcement. Um, so every Tuesday this month, we're going to be doing another conversation with another journalist um, to give you a quick roundup. Uh, next week, we're going to have Jorn Steinmetz. He is a National Geographic photographer, also with New York Times wonderful career he's had. We're really excited to talk to him. Um, the week after, on the 16th, we have investigative science journalist and author Sonia Shah. She wrote the book Pandemic. She has a new book that's coming out, I believe this week, called The Next Great Migration. Um, six, on the 23rd, we have Maria Ressa, and we're really excited to connect with her. Um, wow, that's a good then, get. Yeah, and then uh, on the 30th, we have the new Rome correspondent for CBS, Chris Livesay. So we're really excited for this lineup. We're gonna send you more information in the follow-up emails. Please register when you can. We'd love to have you in the conversation. Will, thank you so much. We hope to have thank you back. You. And it is my pleasure, safe. anytime. And thank okay, you. you too. Thank you, Dan. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Bye, guys. Thanks, Al. Bye.